Praise the Lord. Peace and greetings to you all once again in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. My name is Clinton. To those of you who are in Christ Jesus, of course, you know me as Brother Clinton. And this is the Word Prophet Channel, a Christian ministry dedicated to the purpose of teaching the Word of God to the people in the churches of God so that we can go back to serving God in spirit and in truth, as our Lord Jesus Christ commanded. So, if you have your Holy Bible, King James Version, and you should, please open up with me to Matthew chapter 28. And I want to share with you a passage from the end of that chapter, from the end of the Gospel according to Matthew, which many confused theologians will tell you is actually spurious. Now, spurious is a word that theologians use to describe something that they feel is fake or not genuine or something that was added in later or changed later on by someone else. And that's what many theologians believe about Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Christians don't give heed to such things, but theologians, many theologians, do believe that Matthew 28, 19, along with many other passages of the scripture, shouldn't really be there. And the reason that they make these things up and say that it shouldn't really be there is because it doesn't give credence to the doctrines that they believe. And that's what theology is for. Theology is for twisting around the Word of God in order to make it conform to doctrines that are not written in the Bible. That's what theology is, and that's what theologians are. Theologians are people who falsely profess to be Christians, who believe doctrines that are not written in the Bible, and so they do these mental gymnastics, which we call theology, in order to convince themselves that the Word of God says things that it doesn't say, or that it doesn't say what it actually says. And so having said that, the reason that many theologians think that Matthew 28... Matthew 28:19 is spurious is because they think that Matthew 28:19 the way that it's written in the Holy Bible King James version gives credence to the doctrine of the trinity and it doesn't there is no trinity mentioned anywhere in the Bible and especially in Matthew 28:19 there's no trinity mentioned at all in Matthew 28:19 we have our Lord Jesus Christ speaking to his disciples about a name that's right he was speaking to them about a name, the name which they were to use in order to baptize people so that people could be saved by the power of that name that he was referring to. That's what we have in Matthew 28, 19. So may God bless the reading of his word. If you have your Holy Bible open to Matthew 28, let's start in verse 16. And it says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And of course, we believe that this refers to Thomas because we can see in the gospel according to John that Thomas doubted until the Lord appeared to him a week later. But as we continue, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Praise the Lord. It is a very simple sentence, very simple passage that means exactly what it says. And it doesn't refer to any trinity. It doesn't refer to, there's nothing in this passage of the scripture that refers to three persons or a trinity of gods or a triune deity. The only thing that is mentioned or referenced in this passage of the scripture is one name. The name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, which is, of course, Jesus Christ. And we know this from the scripture because ten days later when the New Testament began, his disciples that he was speaking to in this passage, his apostles, began to preach, repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all those that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's written in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. So we know that the name that Jesus was referring to in this passage of the scripture is his own, because all power is given unto him in heaven and in earth. The Almighty God, who has all power in heaven and earth, gave all that power unto His Son, Jesus Christ, which is the heir of all things. It's really just that simple. 
The Son of God is called Jesus because that's his Father's name. Jesus is a name that means Jehovah the Savior. And the Son of God is called Jesus on purpose. Mary and Joseph didn't make up that name. If you're familiar with the scripture, you know that God sent an angel whose name was Gabriel to tell Mary and Joseph that they were to name the child Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. Because the name Jesus means Jehovah the Savior. And so Jesus, the Son of God, is called Jesus because that's his Father's name. That's what he said. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. But if another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. These are Jesus' words. And in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 4, it tells us that the Son of God obtained a more excellent name than the angels by inheritance. So if he got his name by inheritance, well, who does a son get his name by inheritance from? His father. You see? And the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the scripture, is also called the Holy Ghost. See, because the Bible says when Mary was pregnant that that which was conceived in her was of the Holy Ghost. And Jesus referred to the Holy Ghost that was in him as the Father many times. Why? Because that's what he is. The Holy Ghost is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, God is holy and God is a spirit. A spirit is a ghost. So the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost is a term that refers to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is a spirit and he is holy. There is no other Holy Spirit except God, the Father. He is the only Holy Spirit that there is. And so the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is Jesus Christ. And there are those that will say, well, Brother Clinton, why did Jesus say it that way? Why didn't he just say it like, you know, like I think he should have said it? Come with me to, pardon me, 1 Peter. I was going to say 2 Peter, but come with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. And I want to share with you something that Peter, the Apostle of Christ, wrote down for the church where he was citing from the prophet Isaiah. So let's start in the beginning of 1 Peter chapter 2, but I want to read through verse 8. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. By the way, if you'd like to go through 1 Peter with me, there is a verse-by-verse -verse series on this channel called 1 Peter, and I've gone through the entire letter verse-by-verse -verse for you, with you. So, praise the Lord. But let's continue. Verse 4, To whom coming, as unto a living stone, speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is that foundation stone, that tried cornerstone, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Because Jesus said, as it was written in the Psalms, this is the stone that the builders rejected. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now here's the part that I wanted to call your attention to, and I didn't want to skip the first part because it's necessary for context. But starting in verse 6, we read, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded. And actually, in, in, as we read it in, in the English translation in Isaiah, it says, He that believeth on him shall not make haste. It means the same thing. Because he that, he that hasteth with his feet sinneth. You see? But he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. See, we who believe God's word we believe on our Lord Jesus Christ, we don't have to, we, we don't feel the need to change the word of God around or to claim that certain parts of it really shouldn't be there 
or that they're spurious or that somebody else added them in or changed them later on. We don't we don't have any problems with any verse of the scripture. You see, like theologians do. Theologians invent their own doctrines and then they try to make the scripture conform to their doctrines by using words and phrases in foreign languages and mythological stories about spurious verses of the Bible and stuff like that to try to cause their, their to, 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 pardon me, let me just gather my, my, my thoughts, to try to con cause the Bible to conform to their beliefs. They choose their own doctrines and then they try to make the Bible fit to their doctrines. And for that reason, there's a lot of verses of the scripture that they're afraid of or that they don't want to talk about. You see? But we who are Christians, we don't have that problem because we believe the Bible. And the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. That the man of God may be perfect. How can the man of God be perfect? By knowing what God says, so that he knows what to believe, and so that he knows what to reject as a lie. That's how a man of God can be perfect. And so in English, we have the Holy Bible King James Version, which is the Word of God, which is given to us in the English language, having been preserved for us for the last 2,000 years. And this particular version of the Scripture has been available to us for a little over 400 years. You see? And it's the, it's the Word of God translated for us into the English language. And it means what it says, and it says what it means, and there are no parts of it that are mistranslated or spurious or that have been added in later or, or have, you know, it shouldn't really be there. Because if we say that, then we don't believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And those lost theologians will tell you, when you tell them what the Word of God says, they'll say, well, yes, all Scripture is given of God, by inspiration of God, but, but only the original manuscripts. That's what they'll tell you. And that is an excuse, a lie, and it's an excuse for them to reject anything that they conveniently want to reject and say that in their opinion, that wasn't in the original manuscript. I had somebody tell me the other day that that which is written in Matthew 28, 19 wasn't actually found in any manuscript until the 16th century. That's a complete and total lie. Because Matthew wrote it down in the first century, and it's been there ever since. And it doesn't make any mention of a trinity or a triune God or any three persons. It only makes mention of a name, one name. So then again, there are those who say, well, Brother Clinton, why didn't Jesus just say the, what, the thing I want him to say? Why didn't he just say, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in my name? Why didn't he say that? There's a reason that he didn't say that. Let's continue on in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient... The stone which the builders allowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Remember, it is written in the scripture, a good understanding have all they that do his commandments. And again, it's written in the book of James, be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. That's why there's so many denominations in the world that all falsely profess to be Christians. All of them falsely profess to be Christians because they're not called by his name. They're called some other name. That's why they're called denominations. They've denominated themselves. So they're called by some other name. And why are they called by some other name? Because they can't be called by the name of Jesus Christ because they're not the church of Jesus Christ because they're not abiding in the doctrine of Christ, so they don't have God. That's what the Bible says. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Second John, verse 9. It's just that simple. And so they're not abiding in the doctrine of Christ because they're disobedient. They have come to a certain point in their walk where they decided to please the people instead of pleasing God, which is the same mistake that cost Saul the throne and also his life and the lives of his sons. You see, because Saul went after the will of the people instead of doing the will of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
And so are the people today who go after the will of the people because their church turns into a business and they want money rather than the, the blessing of God, the honor of God. They want the honor of men more than the honor of God. So they have their special seats in the front of the church where they have their, their, their presbytery sit and they think that they're better than the rest. And that's the deeds and the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. And Jesus hates it. They establish clergy and laity in their organizations. Jesus hates that. Jesus hates that. And they do all these things to make manifest their disobedience. And then they get caught up in the nonsense and the witchcraft of theology in order to try to make the word of God conform to their doctrines in their own mind. See, and that's why they can't understand it. And that's why Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. It was a very simple statement that he made to 11 men. And 10 days later, when the New Testament began, they began to preach exactly what he taught them to preach. They didn't have any problem understanding it. You see, because they believed on him and they knew the scriptures. See, as it is written, I lay in, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded. You see, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you have his word abiding in you, then you're not going to be confounded. The scripture isn't going to confound you. It's going to be like sweet bread to you, and you'll, you'll, you'll love it and you'll want more of it day after day. As Even as David said, how sweet is thy word unto my taste. It is sweeter than honey to my mouth. I was just talking to the Lord God about that, I think it was two days ago. And I had to open up my Bible in prayer and, and read that section of the 119th Psalm before God. Hallelujah. That's what the Word of God is to those of us who are born of the Word of God. But those that are not born of the Word of God, they're not born again. Because when a man is born again, he's born again by the Word of God, according to the Scripture. See, those that are not born of God, they don't have God's Word abiding in them. All they have is theology. And so they're confused. They're confounded. And because they're confounded, then they can't believe the Bible as it's written because they can't hear the Word of God. So they have to make up things in order to cause, in their own minds, in order to, conf in order to cause the Bible to conform to their doctrines. And that's why some people will tell you that Matthew 28, 19 is spurious. But a Christian would never believe such a ridiculous lie. Matthew 28, 19 is just like all the rest of the scripture. It's the word of God. And they that believe shall not be confounded. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear.